Hello everybody, welcome to Life in France. Life in France versus the UK. I'm Mark and if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the red button so you don't miss any future releases. Today's video is about scuba diving, scuba diving in France and I'll also be sharing some of my scuba diving stories that I've experienced in the past. I guess I'd better tell you at the start, I'm actually scared of deep water. My nan took me to see Jaws at the age of 11. And since then, it scared the living daylights out of me going into deep water. Now, I was under the impression from Jaws that it was safe. Most shark attacks happen in 12 foot of water up to three foot from the shore. So, in my teenage years, <coughs> I used to go swimming in the sea and I felt I was safe as long as I didn't go over my shoulder. Simple as that. However, <laughs> later on in my teens, I re-watched Jaws and I found out to my horror, most shark attacks are within three foot of water, 12 foot from the shore. So all that time I thought I was safe, I was actually in the danger zone. And even to this day, I hate going into deep water. Yeah, I love scuba diving. Um, you know, if, if I go um, snorkeling in a, in a reef, I feel absolutely safe. You know, I can swim with baby sharks, scorpion fish, lionfish, uh, young moray eels, not a problem. But if I go over that barrier reef and all of a sudden I'm in the deep water, oh, the temperature of the water changes and there's a sheer drop off. My heart goes bound, pounding. I just don't like it. I always swim back into the shallows. Um, however, with scuba diving, I feel really safe. Um, I don't know what it is, but I don't know. I think most of the time you're swimming up against a seawall, so you're protected from one side. Um, I've always been scuba diving in very clear water, so the visibility is really good. And it's the poor visibility that I don't like. That really doesn't feel good with me. So, on to our scuba diving stories. Guys, I'm a paddy qualified diver and I took my paddy course in the Maldives. I actually saw in the new year, the millennium, uh, two, 1999 to 2000, uh, in the Maldives. And it was a wonderful experience to learn to dive in the Maldives because the water temperature was around 30 degrees. Visibility was 30 or 40 meters. It was just the perfect place to learn to dive. Plus, you know, the, the place was just swarming with marine animals. Um, so there was so much to see and it was very safe environment to learn to dive. However, my first open water dive as a qualified diver was carnage. Now before I tell you what happened on that day, it was actually on the 1st of January, I'm going to take you back a little bit and tell you about a story that some friends of ours that I met in the Maldives had with a Japanese instructor. They were on a dive and they were swimming against the current. So they were burning up their air really quickly. They were at 35 meters as well, so their oxygen uh, uptake was increased. And the Japanese instructor asked everyone to let her know how much air they had. And my friend said they had about 50 bar, uh, which was a little bit low. And you know, at that sort of point, you're considering starting to go up. But the Japanese instructor said, no, come on, follow me. We go, I wanna show you something. And against their better judgment, they followed her. After about five minutes, they looked at their oxygen levels and it was now down to 30 bar. So they gave up and told the instructor, sorry, we're going up. Now at 35 meters, it's important that you have a safety stop at five meters for 10 minutes. So they got to five meters, and by this point, um, Dawn's air was really on the minimum level. And uh, they couldn't even do their 10 minute safety stop. Paul had to give her some of her, his air through his octopus in order for her to stay down long enough to do the safety stop. And she finished up without any air in her tank at all. And the lesson they said they learned from that day was never trust anyone else with your own lives. If your gut reaction is not to go along with someone else's instructions, then don't go along with it. 
because at the end of the day, it's your life that's at risk. And that was the one thing they told me. Mark, if you feel that whatever you're being told isn't right and you think it's dangerous, don't go along with it. It's your life down there. It's in a dangerous environment and you need to come up. Okay, on to the 1st of January, my first open water dive as a qualified paddy diver. So we've gone out on the boat and uh, I'm with Paul and Dawn and there's you know loads of French divers and some divers from the UK as well. Real mixed bag on this uh, island of the Maldives. And uh, we all enter the water and the French are just the same when it comes to diving as they are in the cars. You know, face to face, they're really polite. You know, on the boats, you know, they're really nice. Soon as the French scuba divers get in that water, everything changes. And it, we all hit the water and it was just like a mad dash. You know, trying to get in front of everybody else so that they could be the first ones to see whatever fish it was, or turtle, there was to see. And Paul and Dawn's just said to me before we actually entered the water, Mark, it's gonna be mad. Just stay back with us and let them get on with it. So thankfully I listened to them and sure enough, what I witnessed was atrocious. You know, people were banging into one another and it was a mayhem. They were all trying to get in front of one another, to be the first one to see that turtle or the first one to see the moray eel. And uh, the Japanese instructor was there and she had two Japanese clients with her. And I didn't see it, but Paul said, <laughs> the guy that was with the Japanese instructor, he just went straight down 40 metres and he was spread eagled on the bottom. And then he started swimming up again. And uh, he said that the Japanese were all over the place, going up and down. And he was sort of concentrating on taking photographs most of the time, so he didn't see everything that was going on with them. Now, because I was newly qualified, I was probably one of the first people to finish their dive. I think I came up after 25 minutes. So I was sitting on the boat and then a German guy came up next to me and what we witnessed was absolutely atrocious. Um, after about 10 minutes, we saw the Japanese doing the signal for help. So the boat had to go and rescue them. And uh, it was a young couple with the Japanese instructor and the guys on the boat pulled up the girl first and it, if you ever seen those Japanese programs where they sort of punish themselves on these uh, game shows, put themselves through hell, it was like a scene from that. You know, this girl was hoisted up onto the boat and they stripped off her air tank for her and she was literally crawling on the bottom of the boat, throwing up. And then they pulled her husband up or boyfriend and he did the same, you know, they took off his air tank and he was literally crawling along the floor of the boat, uh, throwing up. Never seen anything like it. And then an Englishman and his mate, they came up and they had nosebleeds. And he just shook it off, said, oh, nothing much. It was absolute carnage. And uh, that was my worst experience, I think, uh, in the Maldives as a diver. It was my first dive as a paddy diver. And it was just calm. My second diving experience was the following year, back in the Maldives. And I actually took my Paddy Advance uh, examination uh, on that holiday. And I had some spectacular dives. Um, one of my favourite dives was a drift dive. And um, with that type of dive, the current is extremely strong. And basically, you just shoot along a seawall. 
So we dived in and um, got down to the sort of 20 meters and we literally just put our arms across our chest, had neutral buoyancy and we just spun along the sea wall. And it was fabulous because you could see all these uh, wonderful creatures and fish. Um, and I'm great for spotting moray eels. I love moray eels. You know, I saw the deep when I was a youngster with uh, Lewis Gossett Jr. and Jacqueline Bissett, Nick Nolte. And uh, I always remember the scene with that giant moray eel. And uh, we were zooming along this sea wall and this head just came out of this hole. The moray eel's head was about that deep with teeth so big. And I managed to stop myself and my dive buddy, she and I were watching this moray eel. Along come some French. Now we managed to stop. They wouldn't have stopped if we hadn't moved away. They would have bumped into us. Luckily we had moved away and as soon as they got to this moray eel, they stopped. They deliberately pushed us away from this eel. And then something that I don't do is they started interacting with it. They started trying to stroke it. And I just kept thinking back from the deep and I just thinking, I wish this eel would attack them. <laughs> I know that's horrible to say. But I just had enough of them, you know, they were so much sort of like putting pressure on you to move off um, areas where you had an interest to see something and uh, the way they behaved. One of the scariest dives I had in the Maldives was a night dive. Um, again, it comes back to not seeing what's in the water. Um, I was okay when we went in the water. We all had our torches and uh, we saw loads of uh, different stuff during the night dive. You know, we, I saw a free swimming moray eel. Um, there was a big Napoleon fish that was actually stuck in like a crevice. It, you don't know how it got in there, but it, for safety, it was stuck in this crevice. And uh, we saw loads of things. And then when we turned our lights off, we used to wave our arms in the water and all the plankton would become luminous. And it was just amazing to see. But the scary thing for me was waiting to get out of the water back on that boat. Because, you know, when you're in a group of, say, 12 divers, you know, if, you, if someone is attacked, um, you know, you've got one in 12 chance that it's you. But when you're waiting in the water to get back on that boat, and perhaps you're allowing the women to go on first, and, you know, you're not trying to be pushy like the French, and uh, you're one of the last to leave the water. And for me, I didn't like that. I've only done the one night dive, and uh, it was for that reason. You know, it just came back to my childhood nightmares. I just didn't want to be alone in that dark water, not being able to see what was around me. That's the one thing I've noticed with the French divers. Um, you know, they're very polite on the boat, but when they get into the water, it's very much like they're driving. You know, they're really into sort of trying to get ahead of everybody. There's a bit of bumping and so forth underwater because they're trying to be the first ones ahead of everybody else. They're the first ones to see what's there, you know, to see that turtle, to see the eagle ray. And uh, I don't like that sort of, the way they dive. And on the flip side, they're always the first to get out of the water. There's no chivalry with the French, you know, let the women get out of the water first onto the boat. They're all scrambling up the ladder together. And it's so dangerous because they could slip and fall back and you get a tank in your face. So whenever I've dived with friends, we've just sort of held back a little bit and just let the French get on with it. And you know, sometimes we just hope and pray <laughs> that they fall and smash themselves into the face because they deserve it the way they dive. They're just so unsafe. Um, and I just think, you know, with diving, you have to be safety conscious all the time. Guys, one year, my best friend was over for a holiday in France and in Karnak, I knew there was a scuba club and he wanted to go sailing one day. So I decided to book up a dive. So uh, he went off sailing and I went into the dive club and uh, the guy previously, the day before, said to me, do you want a safety dive? You know, a check dive. And I said to him, no, I'm fine. You know, I've got 40 dives under my belt and yes, it's been a few years, but I do some practicing in the swimming pool. I'm really confident and uh, I don't think I need it. He said, all right, I'll tell you what we'll do. I'll buddy up with you just to keep an eye on you. So I thought, well, yeah, that's okay. And that was my biggest mistake, being blasé. You know, I should have had a, a safety check. And um, the following day, I went on this dive. And I've always been used to warm waters and clear visibility. And this was a whole new ball game for me, diving in France. Um, they said, right, 
you can't wear your shorty, the water's too cold, it's only 16 degrees. Um, you'll have to wear one of our suits. So they gave me a full dive suit, a lot thicker um, material. And uh, they said, what weight do you normally use? Now I'm quite a big guy, more so now than I was then. But I was a very lean 17 stone then. And I always used to get away with just wearing four kilograms. Uh, to the amazement of a lot of people, because I held a lot of muscle tissue rather than fat at the time. And um, they said, oh, we better give you 10 kilos. And I it was so much weight, but I just took their advice. And we got in a, a dinghy and we motored off for about 20 minutes. And when I was on the dinghy, I realised that the dive instructor wasn't going to be my buddy. Because he was going to be looking after eight other divers, all French. And I thought, hang on a minute, you know, how are you going to look after me properly? And we got to the dive site, it was a little island, and um, he'd done my uh, buddy check on me, and I did his. And we all entered the water. I was the last to enter. I've never experienced anything like it. It was like pea soup. I couldn't see my hand in front of my mask. And the water was so cold, and everyone had just shot off below me, you know. Going back to the earlier story, how the French want to get to be the first ones to see anything. So they all shot off. Um, as soon as I hit the water, my weight belt started to slide down my waist and down to my knees. So I'm trying to hoik it up. And after a couple of seconds, maybe 20 seconds, of trying to sort my belt out, I saw the dive instructor swimming up towards me. And I thought, oh, perhaps he's coming to help me. No, he swam past me. Um, turns out that the anchor of the boat had come loose, so he had to go and rescue the boat. Um, so everyone else started to come up, I came up, and we all got back onto the boat again. This time, he's checked my belt properly, and uh, we've repositioned the boat, and we've gone back down. Now, with diving, you cannot keep going up and down, because it can really be unhealthy for you. And, um, so you imagine all these French guys have already been down to 10 metres, 12 metres, whatever it was, before the anchor had started to come loose. Thankfully for me, I'd only got done a couple of metres, so I was okay. So we all went back down again, and it was just a mad rush again. Everyone was bumping into one another, and they were all just looking after their own interests. And the dive instructor was nowhere to be seen. I couldn't see anything. And uh, a French guy went underneath me and I just got hit with all his bubbles and it just lifted me up. And um, I didn't know where I was. I could hear my dive alarm going off, telling me that I was going up too fast. But I honestly panicked. I didn't know where I was. I'd lost sight of everybody. And I was just surrounded by this green mass. And before I knew it, I popped up to the surface. So, you know, I've gone from probably 10 metres straight up without even knowing it, which is extremely dangerous. Now I'm in the situation where I'm the only one up on the surface. I'm aware that the French divers have already been up once. Um, and I'm thinking, now, do I go down to try and find them? Or shall I stay up here and wait for them to come back up? I thought the best thing to do was, because it was my first time up, I'll go back down. So I've swum back down, I'm all calm now, I know what I'm doing, and I've gone back down, swam around for a little while, and I find a couple of divers. But they're not my party. Yes, they were on my boat, but it was a different um, instructor with uh, a single student. And they asked me where I was okay, so I went, yep, yeah, I'm fine. And I said, you know, do you know where my party are? And they said no. And I thought, oh no, what do I do now? Do I stick with these two? and just enjoy my dive, or have my guys gone back up to the surface, are they aware I'm missing? Um, what do I do? So I've indicated to these two guys that I'm okay, and basically I start going up. I have a safety stop on the way up, and I come to the surface. My guys are all waiting for me. They had come up to look for me. So I swam back up to the boat. Because they have now gone down and up twice within 10 minutes, their dive's finished. We wait for about half an hour for the other two that I found to come back to the boat, and we all go back to Karnak. 
The atmosphere on that boat was terrible. They hated me because I'd ruined their dive. And on the way back, the instructor said to me, Mark, I think we need to do a check dive for you. And I said, yes. The next day, I went back to the club from a check dive and the instructor was there and all the other divers were there from the previous day. And in front of everybody, I said to the instructor, I'm sorry, I've got a confession to make. He said, pardon? I said, I lied. I'm not a qualified diver. I just wanted to have a go. The guy's jaw dropped. It almost hit the floor. The reason I said that was when I booked the diving session, nobody asked to see my diving log. Nobody asked to make sure that I was a qualified diver. And it just reminded reminded me of the dangers of diving. You know, there's that movie, um, I'll put a link down to it below because I can't um, remember the name of it, where two divers were left stranded in the ocean. And I thought, you know, because I got lost a couple of times that day, if I'd have died and got drifted away, nobody knew who I was. They didn't take any of my details. And I could have been left and no one would have known where I was, who I was, it was so dangerous. Um, and that was my experience of scuba diving in France. It was atrocious. The fact that they didn't ask who I was, didn't take any of my details, and didn't verify that I was actually a qualified paddy diver. So that's my experience of diving in France. Guys, I mentioned that I qualified as a paddy diver in the Maldives. When I went back to the Maldives the following year, and again when I went to dive in Mallorca, both diving instructors insisted that I go for a check dive. They wouldn't allow me to dive because it had been over 12 months since my previous dive. And what that meant was that it was a one-to-one, -one, half-hour session with the dive instructor in shallow water, just sort of 10 metres deep, just going through all the safety checks, just to make sure that I could control my buoyancy okay, that I was okay when I took the regulator out of my mouth and put it back in again. Um, take the mask off, put it back on, just going through all the safety measures so that he felt I was confident enough to go back into the water. Because at the end of the day, scuba diving is dangerous and you need to take precautions, which didn't happen when I went scuba diving in France. The one funny thing about that French diving uh, day was, as I mentioned, my best mate was over from the UK and we had a competition running who was willing to wear the worst swimming trunks on the beach? We couldn't tell each other what trunks we'd bought and it actually started on the day of that diving day. And I put my trunks on and uh, the worst thing was after the nightmare dive, I forgot a change of clothes. So I had to walk from the dive club to my car to go and get my bag with my extra clothes in just wearing these trunks. 200 metre walk along the promenade wearing those trunks. I just felt everyone was watching me. That was the funniest experience of that dive. So who won the competition for the worst trunks? Well, it was me. My mate said he was gonna bring a fong, but uh, one of those man fongs, but he said he forgot to pack it. But the rules of the competition were, whoever wore the worst trunks on the day, judged by ourselves, the loser would have to buy those trunks for the winner. So it cost my mate 40 euros to buy those trunks for me. The problem with the competition was I had to wear them two days on a trot. The winner had to wear his trunks the following day while the loser could wear whatever he wanted. So I had to wear the trunks twice. I actually like them now, and me and the boys call them my fancy pants. But uh, at the time, it was quite embarrassing. I have been diving in the Red Sea, guys. Um, it was probably one of the worst experiences I've ever encountered for diving and as a holiday. Um, the friends that I met in the Maldives said, Mark, we found this uh, really cheap holiday in the Red Sea, diving in the Red Sea. Um, do you want to go? 500 pounds, fully inclusive for two weeks. I said, oh yes, please. So we booked it up and we were going to go with them on holiday. Um, and I'd heard a lot of great stuff about the Red Sea. You know, there's a lot of sharks, um, there's some beautiful dive sites and um, I thought, yeah, brilliant. What I didn't know, we went to Taba. And imagine the main bulk of the Red Sea, you've got these two little sort of spouts at the top, and Taba is right at the end of one of these spikes. And it's the end of the sea, basically. 
you know, we're right near the Israeli border. You can see Jordan across the uh, other side of the sea. And we, we were like holidaying in a war zone. Um, there was like loads of hotels that were half constructed. You know, there was metalwork sticking out from concrete. And our hotel was one of the only hotels that was fully completed. And not many people were there. And we found out that the hotel owners were allowing their friends and family to stay in the hotel as well, just to keep the occupancy up. And, uh, you know, it just didn't feel like a holiday. Um, there was a security guard at the front entrance and he had to walk through a metal detector. He had a, a gun on him. And we were seven miles from the hotel at Tabba where the diving, structure was, diving centre was. And we had to get a minibus every day to go diving. And twice along that seven mile journey, we were stopped by what looked like armed militia. They had like AK-47s, fully armed. Uh, they weren't wearing proper military uniform. They were all sort of dressed up in black. And we had to take our passports. And they checked our passports. They really gave us an eye over. And it really put you at ease. And when we went to the dive center, they didn't have a boat. They had three different dive sites from the beach. So every day we were more or less diving in the same place and it was just so boring. You know, there were no sharks, there were no turtles, there was nothing big. The only thing that we did see was on the last day, um, we saw a five foot barracuda. Um, and that was like a li large salmon for me. You know, I went quite close to take the photograph whereas the other divers stayed well clear. And they said to me afterwards, cool, you took a chance going so close to the barracuda. But for me, I felt quite safe, you know, because I could see it and uh, I took a nice picture. But um, we never saw anything. The only other thing we saw was uh, frogfish. These are heavily camouflaged fish that literally sit amongst the rocks and they just grab anything that swims past. That was about so big. That was the only other thing that was worth seeing in there. And you couldn't even do a night dive because they were scared you were gonna cross the border into Israel. And you know, you just had the feeling that they were watching you all the time because they had a lookout tower making sure that you didn't cross the border underwater. <laughs> it was that horrible. Uh, I just wanted to come home after the first week. The only good dive we did do, um, I said there were sort of three main sites that they dived from. Um, there was a fourth, and they said it was a little bit wild. You know, there were some building materials that had been dumped in the water, and they don't tend to dive there that often. And I thought perhaps that might be a good place to dive because if the divers weren't going there, there might be a lot of fish. Um, the only problem was it was a one kilometer walk along the beach. So we had to hike all the way along the beach carrying all our dive gear. And uh, when we got to the site, we noticed that there were some Egyptians looking at us a bit strangely. We thought, oh, you know, they weren't that pleased that we were there. When we entered the water, we realized why. There was loads of fish traps, which was illegal. Um, they basically put metal traps down on the bottom, um, they had rope coming up from it tied to a water container that was like a metre below the surface of the water. So for them they just swim out, go down, grab the rope, pull it up the trap and eat the fish. And because it was illegal, uh, I had my knife on me that time, so did my dive instructor, and we basically just cut all the ropes, opened all the traps up, let the fish go, and then the whole party of divers worked for about half an hour, lifting all the traps up, swimming them. Uh, we stayed at 10 meters and then dropping them into sort of 20, 30 meter deep water for the dive club to pick the traps up at a later date, just so that the locals couldn't get at them. Um, and I felt really good doing that dive. I really enjoyed that dive. And that was the dive um, we saw the Barracuda. Oh guys, I've got to tell you this little story. <clears throat> In the Maldives, there was uh, an English guy who was just such an idiot. You know, he was just showing off all the time. I've got this, I've got that. And we were going out to one dive site one day and uh, all of a sudden he's announced to the whole boat, oh, this holiday's cost me a fortune. I've lost 20,000 pounds on my stocks and shares. There was a young lad, probably about 12, 13 there. He turned around to the guy and said, that a teacher for putting all your eggs in one basket? What a slap, brilliant. Wish I'd have done that. Well done to that young lad. Guys, I know this sounds strange because at the end of the day, I've got 40 or 50 dives now behind the belt. And uh, you know, I've swam down to 40 meters. 
I've uh, swam with baby sharks in a, in a reef before, no problems. I love moray eels, lionfish. Um, but even today, if I'm like in, at the seaside in France, I can't go into deep water where there's no visibility. I just feel so vulnerable. I always swim back to the shallows. Uh, it's particularly when you know there's no visibility and you get that change from the shallow warm waters to going out into the colder water. I just don't feel safe. So thanks Nan for that, for taking me to Jaws. But Jaws is actually one of my favourite movies. You know, it was what it did to sharks was criminal. You know, millions upon millions of sharks have been killed because of that film. You know, they, they made the, the sharks into monsters and they're not. You know, I've actually seen uh, documentaries where people are swimming with great white sharks outside of cages. You know, at the end of the day, humans aren't shark food. The only sharks that do like to eat uh, humans are bull sharks. And the reason for that is bull sharks can swim in the sea and fresh water. And in the old days, they used to put all the bodies into the rivers. So they got used to eating humans. Um, and it's just in their psyche now that we are amongst their food chain. But on the whole, tiger sharks eat turtles. Um, you know, if there are attacks by tiger sharks, they tend to uh, let go of us because we're not as crunchy as a turtle. And uh, on the flip side, with great white sharks, they tend to eat seals and we're not carrying as much blubber. So they tend to sort of bite us and let go. Not many fatalities with great white sharks or tiger sharks. The greatest um, fatality rate is with the bull sharks. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video on scuba diving in France and for me sharing my scuba diving stories. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel and don't forget to hit the red button so you don't miss any other videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. Guys, Brucey bonus scuba diving story. I mentioned my friends in the Maldives. Well, they tend to go on scuba diving holidays every year. And one particular year, one particular dive, Paul almost got attacked by a shark. Now, before they went in the water, they were told that the sharks were at 50 metres and uh, they were going to go down to 30 metres to observe and not to go any closer. They went down to the 30 metres and yes, they could see the sharks below them, but then Paul noticed that there was a cave a little bit lower down. So he swam down to this cave, probably about 38, 40 metres, taking photographs of what he was seeing in the cave. All of a sudden he heard this clanging noise. He's looked up and the other divers at 30 metres are indicating shark. He spun round to see this 10 foot shark swimming directly at him in an aggressive behaviour. He's crouched up ready to kick back and the shark got really close to him and then just shot off again. He's then swam up to the other divers at 30 metres. The shark has followed him up and it started to circle them. They all had to finish their dive. It was too dangerous. Um, <laughs> he provoked the shark to come up and join them. So uh, they all had to leave. Thankfully, no one was attacked, but that was a close call.